Uh, he, I think it was on National Barbecue Day, which I think is the last month in May. This is a long time ago, better than 10, 15 years ago, maybe. And he uh, made up some, you know, baby back, you know, ribs, and he did them with his his rub. It was his L. Roker rib rub, and th that's published like on, oh, I don't know, all kinds of different websites, and um, it's actually been in recipe books and stuff. And so, I thought, you know what? I'm gonna try that. Well, shoot, I think the first time I made up the mixture of the spices, it's like. 10 or 11 spices. I'm like, holy cow, this, this stuff's expensive. All the different ingredients. But when you make it up, I mean, my probably like bought a maybe a pound of uh, you know, this rub mixture, and but it lasts forever. And I use it a lot. Oh, um, you do? I use it a lot. And and over a course of time, I'm using it many times. Um, you don't have to use much to create, you know, a really good flavor on any type of meat. I've used it on, you know, every type of pork. Um, I've tried it on chicken, and it's actually pretty good on chicken. Um, but uh, probably the, you know, my favorite thing to smoke right now is a huge pork shoulder, or also known as a pork butt. And the local grocery chain here, Meyer, which would be like a uh, uh, like a Fred Meyer or a Piggly Wiggly or, you know, something like that. Um, we'll have sales about every six weeks or so where they knock two bucks off a pound. Well, that takes a two ninety nine a pound pork butt down to 99 cents a pound. It's hard to beat at any, you know, anywhere at that price. And so I'll buy usually two, sometimes four, but... <laughs> <laughs> If you got freezer space, why not? Because they're vacuum packed, so they're ready to just throw in the freezer and pull them out any time. So I did. I bought two a week ago, and uh, put one in the freezer and left one in the refrigerator. And six o'clock this morning, I was rubbing my butt, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, I let it sit out room temperature while my smoker's heating up. And uh, yeah, I just probably about an hour ago. Yeah, you know, about an hour ago, I pulled the butt out. Uh, wrapped it in foil and it's kind of, it's kind of a cheater they call it a cheater way of speeding up your cooking process um but to me it helps you know seal in the flavor and the juices and everything too um because when you smoke at a low temperature uh, it, the smoke flavoring and everything you get that smoke ring on the meat it uh it can only take so much smoke in so you only smoke for about the first two hours mm -hmm. after that it's just heat and so the reason you go slow is because you want to heat the meat slowly, try to retain moisture, and but you got to get that internal temperature up. And then also, a pork shoulder is typically a tough meat. It's like a brisket. The reason you do it slow is to break down, um, uh, break down, uh, you know, all the you know cartilage and connective tissue and everything, so that the meat is tender and you can actually chew it, you know, and not have to gnaw into it and try to grind it down. So when you cook it longer and you bring it up to a much higher temperature internally, it breaks down all that connective tissue. And then you've got pull apart pork and it's, and it's really, really tasty. So yes, I was rubbing my butt early this morning and dropped it in the smoker. Probably have about another, uh, about another three hours or so before I pull it out and, and uh, get it torn apart. But uh, yeah, it's smelling great outside. I'm, keep waiting for cars to stop and wondering if I'm selling it or something, you know, <laughs> good stuff. Yeah. I have a friend, uh, Joe, he loves to smoke and he does a great job of smoking fish and salmon and mm. alba cheeks. And whenever I go fishing, if I catch anything, I usually take about half my catch and take it up to him to let him smoke because, oh, this like candy afterwards. Right. Right. Now, what you brought to him now, you, I've seen some of your, your fishing adventures. Uh, is that mostly um, coho salmon that you're doing? Uh, let's see, mainly coho. Um, um, we get a, a, a couple blackmouth. Okay. But, but yeah, mainly, mainly coho. Uh, um, let's see. We're, if we're really lucky, we'll get some some kings, but 
uh, a couple of years ago, I, I caught a white king. White. So, a white king. Hmm. Uh, they're uh, a white king. Uh, basically, their DNA is structured that they can't uh, process part an element of some of the food that they take in. So their flesh turns out, instead of being pink, comes out white. Ah. And it's a, and I thought, you know, I, I think I, I think I prefer the pink ones. It's a, and then we have all these, you heard about, uh, it was about four years ago, a bunch of, uh, uh, farm raised salmon, their nets broke. And so they just flooded the ecosystem. So it was great for the fishermen because uh, the game service said, okay, boys, go out there and fish as much as you want. And you know how to tell them apart uh, because hatchery fish have a tiny little fin that's removed off them. And so when, you, when you're fishing these days in the river, if you catch a natural salmon, you just release it. But if it's, a, if it's one that was raised in one of the fisheries or from um, one of the fish beds, uh, those, you, you, those you can take home and keep. So. Not, not because there's any nutritional difference or anything, but purely because of that on unplanned release of those fish right right those those fish aren't indigenous really to the area they're more like atlantic salmon they're not going to really um go anywhere ex except eat up resources that the the more regional fish would get right so yeah so it's been good fishing for the last couple of years for uh, some people as we're catching all these farm fish yeah. um and a lot of people went out there straight away to catch the farm fish. But that, yeah, but also, uh, besides the farm fish, it's the hatchery fish. You can only keep those. <clears throat> they want to make sure that any salmon that naturally uh, goes upstream and has a, a, um, a biological imperative to do that, to reproduce in a stream, you want to give those guys as much of a shot as possible. Right. Right. But I am so looking forward to fishing this year because I wasn't able to fish with my brothers last year. We've we've kind of made an annual tradition now on the first week of October. We all go out, hire some guides, and go uh, uh, fly fishing on uh, either the Ho River or one of the other rivers over by a squim, you know, where they yep. uh, filmed the uh, Twilight. Right, right. I only know that area because I've driven around it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but unlike you, I never got into. I never have. I don't have any hunting experience. Just a lot of fishing experience. How was your turkey hunting uh, last? Uh, month? You know, here's the deal. So, um, the turkey population in Michigan has been growing leaps and bounds unbelievably over the past decade, over the past 20 years, um, to the point where really they should just be open season all the time because they're invading neighborhoods and they're, they're a destructive bird. I mean, they, they tear up yards and gardens and gee, and if you hit them with a vehicle, it's like hitting a, a big dog. I mean, these things can do some damage. So, um, but it is still a controlled hunt. Uh, twice you know a year in the spring once in the spring once in the fall and you know and i see these things all the time in fact i got a picture i might uh share here as well that i took coming out of prison one day three huge toms you know bearded they got you know nice spurs on the back of their legs you know just standing around outside the prison i'm like man i should come hunt out here though that might be frowned upon a bit <laughs> um so this year spring hunt uh me and my buddy clay we were up had you know brought my camper up got camp set up got blinds set up and didn't say a single bird while we're in the blind oh. 
<laughs> saw him driving around and everything. Saw deer all over the place. You know, not while in the can't shoot him if <laughs> you know you don't see him. You know, so um, but it's still good to get out there and everything. You know, it's to me, uh, I could hunt all day long and and not shoot a single thing. And that's totally fine because I get to do something that a lot of people don't get to do, which is see mother nature wake up. It's a, it's a weird thing. See everything go from black, you know, pitch dark out, no street lights. You know, if you're lucky, you got moonlight or stars and you start to see some shadows, but everything kind of goes from gray into some bluish colors and everything starts to take shape and you start to hear things that you don't normally hear different animals and birds and I, you know, even heard, uh, you know, ice melting off from trees. You know, you pick up these things and uh, that, that, that to me is nirvana, really. I know exactly what you're talking about. In order to get into the best wells within the river, our guides will put us in anywhere from three or four o'clock in the morning. And then we're just sitting there for the next three hours waiting for the sun to come up. And, you know, you got the the heater going by your feet and just watching just little movements coming across the waters, little sounds. See that kingfisher get the first breakfast of the day. Oh man, it's great. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. That is that's a really nice time. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really different. And you know, to be able to see that and experience it. And then and then having had the experience and then to be able to go out, you know, I expect it. I look forward to it, you know, and even when it starts to happen again, it's different in some ways. So every, every day, it's like a new show, you know, you just get to see, you know, the earth waking up and all these different sights and sounds happening. And I've seen some crazy things last year. Uh, I think it was during rifle season for deer um, was sitting, uh, pretty quiet morning and I had um what I thought was you know a small doe coming running across the two track coming towards me and I was out of the corner of my eye and when I looked that way it was a coyote and the thing was just carrying the mail it was running so fast and I've never seen one during the day like that you know in my blind I've seen fox before but never coyote Hmm. Um, that was pretty interesting um and you know we've got in in that area too uh which if you look at michigan it's a little about two-thirds of the way up uh towards uh, the top of the lower peninsula is where i'm at and in this area there's there's bear um i haven't seen them and i don't want to see them because you know they can eat me <laughs> um <laughs> There's coyote, uh, there's fox, um, there's even bobcat. There's quite a few bobcat around there too. Um, uh, fortunately, most of the time where I'm at, um, very little bear encounter. Uh, my younger brother, Mike, he hunts about five miles south of me and they've got bear on video while they're in their tree stands. I'm like, you know, there's, there's another place I don't want to be is in a tree stand. <laughs> bear can climb trees. <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. Um, nope. So, um, but it's, it's a good time. It's, it's mentally cleansing, you know, for people that uh, might not hunt, um, they might view me as, as, as you know, crazed you know animal killer out there just slaying everything that moves on oh, no, i i do more watching and appreciating of animals you know even deer when it's deer season i watch a hundred times more deer than i shoot and uh both for legal and for just personal reasons you know um i've had it to where uh, i think it was the year after my motorcycle accident i was actually hunting with a 357 handgun um i just couldn't hold uh a rifle at the time and I was walking one day with a cane and everything. And I sat, I decided to sit down and just watch a field. And I kind of just backed into this pine tree, the short pine tree and a doe and a yearling, you know, probably about a eight, nine month year old deer, a baby deer come walking up right almost to me, probably within about 10 feet. And the baby didn't think anything of me, but the, the mom was kind of upset because she didn't, she knew I didn't look right. I looked out of place. 
So she'd snort a couple times. She'd pound her front paws on the ground to try to get me to move. I never moved. I just kept sitting still and watching her. You know, so that was a neat experience to be that close to them and to have them not freak out and just take off. I was able to sit there and kind of fool them for a minute and uh, got, got pretty close to them. That was neat. So I got a, I got an, an elk story. Um, my wife and I were walking along the whole river. Beautiful, beautiful little day hike. You know, a nice, relatively flat, about seven miles in, you get to this wide open meadow, and then you can go a little bit farther past that. It'd be a great place to, to uh, campsite, but you know, you're in, in the whole river national forest reserve. So, uh, we're walking around, uh, walking in, and uh, it's, you know, nice, you know how it is, huge trees, fair amount of uh, shrubs around you. But for the most part, some fairly clear around where the slough is on the ground. And uh, my wife comes to a stop and she says, uh, look, there's some elk up farther on the, uh, on the trail, what do we do? I said, well, are they coming this way? She says, yeah, I think they are. <laughs> well, well, let's, uh, let's just stand over here next to, between these two trees and we'll just uh, wait for them to come by. So along come three or four and then another four and then another four <laughs> I and now they're all around us they're you know they're they're just we're surrounded by all these huge i mean they're they're big tall elk you know they're, those animals are massive they're huge oh, oh, they're huge it's like being next to a vw bus <laughs> yeah. and, and and we're about around a hundred or so of them and suddenly there's this big bull, he's about uh, 15 feet away coming up and he sees us. And he's looking at the, the, all the other, at the rest of the cows. Like, Haven't you guys noticed that there's some people right here? <laughs> and he says, he's checking us out. I said, well, don't do anything. Just stay still, be calm. We can be patient. We can let them go by. This is interesting. Just so he kept eyeing us while the rest of their herd went by and slowly but surely they all went through. But, you know, it took about half an hour. But, oh, my God, you know, just all could not believe the size of them. They were just massive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they probably I bet they averaged 800, 1200 pounds a piece, I bet. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Yeah. I almost ran into a, a mom and a calf one time. I was driving back from a, a, a meeting out of Traverse City, Michigan, back to one. Uh, I lived in Alpena, which is very northern lower peninsula, Michigan, and driving through the city of uh, Atlanta, Michigan, which is the elk capital of Michigan. I came up over a hill and I was driving a full size extended cab Chevy pickup truck, uh, three quarter ton truck, and I put both feet on my brakes, stood on the brakes as hard as I could because they were just standing in the middle of the road and I came within a couple feet of taking out both of them. And the mom's back was actually above the hood of my truck. <laughs> they, they would have totaled my truck without a doubt. Um, yeah, that was, that was frightening because those animals are, they are huge, absolutely huge. Speaking, yeah, go speaking of huge, I'm gonna to totally change the subject. Are you watching the May tournament? Yes, I am watching the May tournament. We've been uh, watching ever. We're big sumo fans, so. Oh, let's see. Who am I ro rooting for? Uh, well, I remember watching the tournament where he he Ocean won all fourteen. Mm -hmm. Remember that, and yep. and he, and ever since then I've been a fan of his, but. 
I, so I've been kind of sad to see his career decline because he's just not been performing as well right. as he would. And and then Rudin, he's not even up there anymore. He's down down in uh, Jurio. Yeah, I was I was wondering because he wasn't in the March tournament, but I was kind of glad to see Enho finally show up in a match. Um, you know, rooting for the little guy. I, I, He's he's got a lot of spirit, you know, and uh, but the one that really shocked me was uh, was it day three or day four? In fact, I had to show it to, I had to show it to my daughter, and my son. I said, "You're not going to believe what this what this uh, what this rookie did to this old old timer." Uh, was it Akaseyama? Um, he got slapped by that. Uh, oh yeah, that that. <laughs> <laughs> You could hear that thing around the world. Oh, that, and you knew he just wasn't the same after that. Just got yeah, <laughs> he slapped him so hard. I mean, it just echoed in there. I'm like, oh my god, it shocked him. I think that's why he won because he just totally was not expecting that. So, have you been watching the uh, Sumo Princess? I was surprised to see her back there. Yeah, she's <laughs> kind of pleased to see her back there. And this time, because at the last boss show up in the stands she was right in the middle yep and she wasn't standing out as much as when she's been sitting off to the side so we were kind of going it kind of like the you know hide and go uh, seek peekaboo element right. of her right so she's back in her old position yep. yeah we always gotta watch what she's dressing i mean what she what dress she's wearing yeah <laughs> yep. exactly but uh yeah I'm 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 really voting. I'm hoping that Takayasu. Takayasu definitely. Yeah, he's a man. He got so denied. I mean, he did really good at the last boss show, and then started losing towards the end. I was really hoping that he would follow into it. Didn't even make it into the final rankings, though. Yeah, I think he just totally lost focus. I don't. I don't think he was injured at all. He just. He just kind of forgot what to do. I think he just didn't look right. You know. And uh, but I still, uh, I think this is the second one in a row. I think it's Kaise. The dude has got a mean attitude about him, and it and it's working. He just man, he's just brutal out there. There's a lot of blood in this basho. Yes, a lot of forehead cuts. Did you see the one yesterday, where head plant head right in? Yes. Yeah, and right just a bamboo. Oh, it just just <laughs> blood right all over the forehead. Oh, that was a that was a good battle too. Yeah, yeah, it was. That's crazy. And I think there were what uh, two hankas yesterday where they jump aside and and try to grab the belt and shove them out of the ring. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah we... what, those guys are. Um, I think I told the story before, but uh, Mr. Iraqi had uh, paid for us to spend the day with the Rikshi up in Fukuoka. Oh, he did? Yes. And so we drove up there, went into uh, their training camp, watched them train. And these dudes, they're going at it all day long. But we got to eat lunch with them. The, the, big. Uh, the big pot, of, you know, the hot pot of, you know, they dump everything in this. And it's like 90 million calories. And so we're chowing this stuff with them. And, and uh, I tell you what, those guys are solid and they do this all day long. You know, I, there's gotta be some that have a heart attack and just die at camp. They just don't talk about it, <laughs> you know? but the guys are solid. I mean, they could, you know, they could, you know, pull a bus down the street. These guys are strong. Um, you look at Akaseyama. Yeah. He's kind of out of shape. Yeah. But, He's also 35 years old. I mean, give the guy a break, I guess. <laughs> it looks like he had really bulked up and then kind of deflated down again. <laughs> so. Yeah. 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 That, uh, yeah. That toning up didn't quite work for him, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think it's Abe. My wife has been watching him. She, uh, she uh, became a fan of his when he was younger and thinner. But now he's been putting on more of that full sumo weight. Mm -hmm. And at first he was kind of sluggish, but now he seems to be coming into his own. So she's she's a big fan of Abby. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
so we usually watch the we we watch it around 4 30 every day now that my wife's home otherwise we'd watch it at 9 30 at night that's what time it comes on for us what yeah. time do you normally watch it i usually catch the highlights the 27 minute version um about 10 p.m here it's not it's available before that on demand on nhk but um i usually catch about 10 p.m it's the last thing i watch i shouldn't do that before i'm going to sleep you know i'm getting all worked up on sumo <laughs> But yeah, that's what yeah, I do. My, my wife and I we get really excited because you know how you're they're telling people not to cheer at the things because of cold COVID. So here we are in our living room and we're all just going, oh <laughs> 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 and I can just imagine what we'd be like when we're there. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because we did, I think I can't remember if it, if it was just a trip to Tokyo. Actually, maybe twice. I think. School trip in December, we went to a match in Osaka. And then I went to one in Tokyo as well. I think I've been to two of the tournaments and uh, pretty neat. You know, it, the only time I saw Tokyo was in the few days before we left Japan. I, I yeah. mean, I saw Osaka, Nara, and Kyoto during our school trip. And that was a blast, but... Yeah, in uh, December of 79, uh, just before our school trip, I flew up to Tokyo with Mrs. Araki. Um, two things. We went, I was a guest at one of the Tokyo Rotary Club's meetings. Um, so we went to a meeting there. And the primary purpose of the trip was to um, see my her son, my brother Kenji, because he was going to the engineering uh, university in Chiba. Um, so I think we spent uh, about four days in Tokyo. And then we also met up with my father's friends from post-war, uh, the Sasaki family, and um, ended up doing a couple of really, really nice dinners with them at one of their restaurants. Um, do a little bit of sightseeing. They put us up on a one of the sightseeing buses for the Tokyo area. So that was pretty cool. But then um, went back again, the last week we were in Japan, Sasaki's put Art and I up at, uh, uh, I believe it was a Takanawa Prince Hotel. And then we spent four out of those five days on bullet trains and buses going everywhere. Um, oh, our, wow. I, yeah, we had a good time. Art and I had a really good time. <laughs> That was dangerous putting us two together. <laughs> so I'm trying to remember something. When we were in Beppu, mm -hmm. and at that wonderful place with you know a hundred different types of baths. Yep. I remember you, me, and Art going in and getting buried up into our necks. Now was that coffee grounds or was that hot sand? I'm trying I think to remember. It was I, I, I think it was hot sand. I think that one was hot sand, volcanic sand. Okay. Yep. Because I really remember enjoying that. But for some reason in my head, I thought coffee grounds, or maybe it was just the smell of it that was making me think that. Yeah, because then, then we went into the the bathhouse, into the, the family side, where they gave us the little doily-sized towels. <laughs> <laughs> And that's when we sat in the one tub and the 80-year-old grandma came oh, and yeah. sat between Art and I. <laughs> that is still burned into my mind. <laughs> the expression yeah. on Art's face. <laughs> yeah, he blushed that day. I actually saw him blush. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was that was educational. <laughs> Yeah, dang, good times. <laughs> now, I remember that there was a time that you guys went down to the beach to drink some wine. Oh, I can't confirm or deny that. <laughs> and I, I, a few of us stayed behind. I stayed behind because I was just tired and I wanted to lie down for a bit. 
and uh, I'm trying to remember if it was Denise who stayed behind and Kim or who it was. I remember, I remember all of us swimming in the ocean towards dusk one time, but I can't, all I can remember is Brother Pat coming in, asking where you guys were and being so mad and then heading off to see where if he could find you. And I'm kind of going, oh man, I hope he doesn't catch up. Yeah, no, Denise was down there. I was down there. Eric was down there. <sighs> Ruth, I think, was down there for a little bit. But she, it seems to me she went back to the room. Yeah, I don't think she was, feeling, she was well. feeling well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't think that, I don't she... him being down there. Art might have been, but yeah, I think. Uh, I think Tim and Tim and Terry started all that, and they got us in trouble. They're the ones that got the wine. <laughs> yeah, I left us holding the bag. Boy, brother Pat was pissed. <laughs> oh, he was pissed. It was no big deal for me. I saw him like that all the time. You guys, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> that was a natural state of affairs, was it? <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, well, you guys get to experience it now. Here we go. <laughs> he had a temper. Wow. Uh, let's see. So, well, thanks for letting me know that it was volcanic sand. That, yeah. that really helps my memory quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, hey, on NHK, I also saw, I think it's still out there. They've got a uh, like a documentary piece. I don't know if it's in their travel section or something, but they go to that uh, that seaside shrine and cave down in. Yes, I've in, seen that in Kagoshima or Miyazaki. I think it was. Yeah, they talk about well, you can go out swimming in that, but bring your flippers because it's a pretty strong current. I'm like, I wouldn't have gone down in that. That was like a oh no, that, that looked there. nuts. I yeah no. no. <laughs> They say people swimming and I'm like, well, people probably drown in it too. <laughs> now, I remember uh, it wasn't with you guys, but my host families took me to a really long cave system at one time. And I think it was on Honshu. I think we spent the day, day uh, driving. It was no, took a bus, did a package tour, drove off the island, went on to Honshu, and then went into this long cave. And we were walking underneath this cave and then broke into a river that hit a small uh, shrine just inset against the wall before you came out to a larger shrine. And then the whole town, which is basically a giant tourist trap for right. this cave. I wish I could remember the name of that place. Did you have any experience in a, in a cave like that? Or I've I've got I think I've got pictures from there, and and I still don't know exactly where it's at, but it's in the same set or rolls of film uh, to when uh, we went up to Hiroshima, which would be right. I mean, it was right along that you know same direction. Get on to Honshu, not too far, and. Yeah, there was uh, uh, hot springs, this cave, and yeah, I, I remember that. It's it's got to be the same place. I don't think this was on Kyushu where we were. No. Um, and it was, I think, either just before we got to or the heck we were coming back from uh, Hiroshima. I remember it being just hot and humid, like crazy in there too. Yeah, it was killer warm in those caves. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful, though. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Very similar to some caves I went to a couple years ago down uh, near St. Louis uh, in Missouri. They've got some really cool cave systems down there that uh, um, pretty interesting. But they, not tropical, of course. It was quite cool. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife has... Uh... She's a little claustrophobic. So the idea of going down into a cave doesn't really appeal to her too much. So yeah, yeah, it wouldn't. Yeah, the ones in 
that one in Japan there, um, those kids are huge. I know it was uh, mammoth. Was very, yeah, they're a little tight in some spots. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you you'd be in this one large cavern area, and then you go down through a little crack, kind of along through a tube. It would have slowly opened up, and then it'd be this big, wide, low ceiling area. Yeah. And I don't know. I had great fun that day. Um, I had one experience early on. My uh, host families or my club asked me, Mark, do you want us to let you know what activities you'll be doing or do you just want to be surprised? And I thought, <laughs> I thought, oh, if I know everything on the calendar, then I'm going to have to put work into it. I'm such a lazy kid. I'm still lazy. But so I said, no, just make it a surprise. I, I, so I'd wake up, and if my bag was by the front door, I knew that uh, it was a sign from my host mom that we were, I was going to be going somewhere. So I'd put some clothes into it. Somebody from Rotary would pick me up. I'd be off on another adventure. <laughs> and I went to this, uh, uh, this island one time. We're, we're the only ones on this really dinky, almost a tugboat size ferry with, a, I think it could fit four cars. Wow. Know. So we unload and the guy is unloading these big bags of dog food. And I'm wondering what's with all the dog food. And then, he's, then he just, uh, then there's this like single road, uh, lane road along the edge of the beach going along and he says watch this and he rips up in the top and he's running down the street and he's just tossing dog food left and right and left and right all over the place and he says hey come here follow me you're supposed to be keeping up i said okay so i started going up to him and all of a sudden i am surrounded by all these deer eating up all the dog food just <laughs> hundreds of them just poured out of the Oh, that was a blast. That was hilarious. <laughs> uh, when you were in Nara for your school trip, mm -hmm. did those deer bite you in the butt? Oh, yeah. It's like they're pre-programmed to do it. Is it because every, all the kids were putting their rice crackers in their butt? Yeah, they're back, putting pocket? back pockets, carrying around, and yeah. Oh. Yeah, there's a write-up passage for a young adult in Japan. Get mm -hmm. bit by a deer. Exactly. Jeez. Yeah, though they were quite pesty. <laughs> I wish I could have done some fishing when I was in Japan. That would have been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. A uh, classmate of mine, uh, Kazuaki, um, in fact, he was just uh, up in the Mount Aso area uh, planting rice yesterday. And he shared a bunch of pictures of that. He does it every year does the planting and also does the harvesting and um, just beautiful area, but he does a lot of fishing as well. And <clears throat> almost, <clears throat> almost all of it from like charter boats and that out in the, like the Yasuhiro area, out in the Ariaki Sea there and uh, catching, uh, oh, what are they like? Uh, not gobies, there's a, uh, forget the name of the fish um but they they eat it as sashimi they they steam it they fry it uh, it's a very versatile very flavorful fish but he says they're just a blast to catch i wish i would have done some fishing out there but you know you know between all my other you know rotary activities like ice hockey and stuff like that <laughs> you know riding motorcycles around you know with people that uh, yeah that cut into some of those activities i'm sure <laughs> so what's this a uh, small world story you've been saving up <clears throat> so as, as part of you know my daily routine you know i'm seeing a i've got like printer just printers alone i've got like 500 printers in a geographical area that covers uh maybe nine counties in western michigan maybe 11 counties now um probably the largest number, maybe close to 200 of them are with the uh, state of Michigan. So um, Department of Health and Human Services offices, Secretary of State or Department of Motor Vehicles, um, state police 
offices and uh, prisons, you know, so I'm in prison a lot. Um, but also quite a few schools in that. And I just had a uh, week and a half ago, uh, a, a fleet refreshed. So I had 11 printers at uh, Montague schools, which is right along the lake, so lake Shore, um, and Lake Michigan, just north of Muskegon. Um, they had their entire fleet. They renewed their contract, getting all new printers. So I had to go out and deinstall and reinstall the new printers. Well, you know, for the last couple of years, I've been taking care of them. And I've met their IT director, older guy, I'd say older, you know, early 60s, mid 60s, maybe. Real nice guy, guy by the name of John Rockwood. And, but I always, you know, I'd be at one of the school buildings and he would just happen to be walking by and we'd talk a little bit and he'd go off and do things. Never really just sat down and talk, even though, you know, my main contacts were usually the, you know, the administrative assistants or the secretaries in each office or each school. Um, but he's like, he's the head cheese of all these people and all these, uh, all these printers. So coordinate with him pretty much how I'm going to do all these installs. And, and uh, so he was kind of keeping tabs on me and then he needed help with something, wanted to know how to do something. So I said, Hey, I'm at the high school, which is where his office is that I'll come down and I'll show you how to do this. He's like, okay, cool. So I go down there and we never really small talk. This was at the end of the day, I'm trying to help him with something. And it just, I just had a thing like Rockwood. I know, a, I know a Rockwood, but this doesn't make any sense because this goes back to North Muskegon, which isn't far away, 20 miles away from this area. And it goes back to Rotary Exchange days. And I asked him, I said, hey, John, I said, totally not business. I said, are you related to or do you know an L Rockwood? He says, why? I said, well, you know, Al Rockwood, I said, he's from North Muskegon. He says, well, that was my dad. I'm like, your dad? Seriously? He's like, yeah, how do you know him? I said, well, I was in exchange to, to Japan in 1979-80. He says, you've got to be kidding me. I said, no, I'm serious. I said, I spent, you know, probably six or eight weeks at, at your dad's house learning, you know, civics and how to be an ambassador. I said, we were alternating between your house, or I said, your dad's house and Carol Cole's house both, you know, huge mansions on Muskegon Lake. Carol Cole, a guy, um, started a bakery uh, at a very young age. It would have been in the 1930s or so in Muskegon. Ended up um, becoming this huge monster uh, uh, bread making um, type of company, famous for their garlic bread, Cole's garlic bread. And Denise would probably I'm sure she'd recognize it because it's in the stores all over the place here but anyways between the Rockwoods and the Coles house me and another uh outbound exchange student um and I had to be also the one from my school that just recently passed away he had to be there too sometimes now I think about it but we had these small classes for a couple hours you know once a week and and John says yeah he says my mom's still alive she's 96 and she's sharp as a tack he says I'll says I'll uh says I'll mention you he says I'm sure she'll remember you I'm like you know they had to do this every year you know with the different outbound students and stuff but he's like oh yeah and you went to he says I'm sure you went to Camp Cat and all this I said oh definitely I said you know and that's what probably the first time I met Denise was at this uh sure. inbound outbound orientation conference thing um they had a couple before we left and a couple when we came back that I went to and uh, I think it was there that I, I either finally was told or realized that I was going to Japan. And, uh, and Denise says she remembers me there and they, you know, I was the best drummer there. And I don't remember any drummers there. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's just a super small world. Had I never asked, you know, I think I had thought of it before Rockwood. Man, there's just, you don't, I don't run into people with unique names and, and, not ask you know hey by chance do you know so and so this one you know probably six or seven times i never asked him i think i thought about it this time i thought you know what i'm asking him and sure enough wouldn't you know it was his dad um so yeah so now we're like best buds and he's texting me all the time like 
every little printer. <laughs> Dude, I can't do this, you know. But uh, yeah, very small world. I mean, you know, and and for some reason, and and I don't think it was from our group. And I know I talked to Terry about this, but in 1982, I believe it was spring break. Me and a buddy of mine, we drove down to Florida didn't have one sober day down there out of about 12. We ended up at University of South Florida because one of our junior high classmates who ended up moving to Florida was going to college there. Well, he and I ended up staying in the girls' dorm. This None of us should be, should be a shock to anybody. So I, the, you can record this, no big deal. It's, it's just me. So we're in the girls' dorm and our friend, um, who I also have since found on Facebook and we're friends now and everything. She's a nurse in Minnesota, but she was talking to a friend of hers that was skipping a semester and had moved back to Pennsylvania. And we were, we were all getting ready to go out and shoot pool and shoot darts and hit the local bar and everything, which ended up being a gay bar. That's another whole story that we'll tell later. <laughs> but we're waiting for her to get off the phone. We had to go. And so I'm like, Debbie, come on. Her name is Debbie. I said, Debbie, come on, we got to go. She's like, just man, I'm, I'm finished up with my friend. I said, well, let me talk to your friend. So I go, hey, this is Dave. She says, hi, Dave. This is, I wish I could remember her name because at first I thought it was Terry. But, but that's towards the end of the story. So we're talking and within 30 seconds, she says, Dave, she says, you're from Michigan, right? I said, I don't think I remember telling her this, but Debbie was from Michigan originally. So I said, yeah, from Michigan, why? She says, were you an exchange student to Japan? I said, yes, how do you know this? And she says, because we were there together. I'm like, what? She says, <laughs> yes. She says, we were there at the same time. And the only thing I can figure is maybe Debbie had mentioned something and she had been, and I confirmed this with Debbie, yes. She was an exchange student to Japan, 7980, but I don't think she was in our district. But she recognized my voice and everything. She's like, Dave, you're an exchange student in Japan. Oh, right? Which is like, oh. amazing because I know that I think we gathered up with the other exchange students maybe twice, just when we arrived and as we were leaving, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. But this this but yeah, i wish i could remember her name oh man she was in pennsylvania that's what i was thinking god dang i wonder if it was terry i was talking to <laughs> but it was a disaster man. oh well that's hilarious yeah but again another you know very small world this happens to me quite a bit um that's probably the most shocking one but again here just in the last couple of weeks it has to do with you know exchange and everything Wow. I mean, to go back 40 some years and just happen to run across across somebody that you know is relation to and very knowledgeable of the exchange program. So it's pretty neat. One of the people I knew in Japan was a, a girl. Um, I think her father was Japanese, her mother was American, or was it the other way around? Anyway, uh, so she had relatives in Izumi. So she came to Izumi. Her name was Ann. And uh, she's from Michigan. You know, it's, it's weird. It's sort of like Mich Michigan and Japan have like this weird connection, it seems. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I think some of it is, honestly, is uh, drugs. I mean, like Pfizer, not, not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But you know the pharmaceutical industry is huge here. Um, medical industry, you know, Stryker Corporation, uh, Pfizer, and then the big three, because I've got um, friends on Facebook that are uh, fellow alumni of uh, Kumamoto High School um, that have been to Michigan many, many times. A lot of them into the Livonia, Troy, and Detroit area, of course, all automotive related. So. Um, so I think there's, you know, a lot of connection that way, as, uh, from the standpoint of being Michigan and Japan interaction and stuff. So, 
Yeah, I think that a lot of it has to do with the auto industry and, and some pharmaceuticals. Have you ever tried to, uh, I've tried to go onto Google Maps and do sort of like a drive around to see if I could even locate where I used to live and possibly recognize anything? I've done it. I've done I, it. I haven't been able to recognize anything. My, Zoomy has changed so much for me. Yeah. Well, th yeah, that's probably the downside for you because that area could change quite a bit. Though I think that there was that one, was it a video that you shared about yes. that one? It didn't look like the downtown strip had changed too much. No, it looked, it looked pretty much the same. Yeah. That part. But everything out around it, yeah, it changed a ton. Um, the Iraqis house, I actually, the only way I could find it, I couldn't do it from an aerial, but I did it from Google Earth Street View. And I downloaded Google Earth Professional on my laptop, which you can get for free now. Um, and I took it from Kumamoto Castle because I could find my way around from there fairly oh, well. Yeah, you 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 were on a bike, so you probably knew the roads pretty well from some visual <laughs> yeah. memory. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But I mean, even like from I followed like the bus route. Like I could remember the bus route from Kumamoto Castle to the Iraqi house. I knew where I ended up, and then when I got off the bus, walked up to the corner, took a right, and then there's a small little residential road to the left that I would go. So I did that, but. That whole area, they changed the way the road. Um, oh, and I had a handwritten note that showed a um, like a heating and ventilation contractor right on the corner. That company is still there. So I looked <laughs> out and you know thought, saw the name of the company and everything. I'm like, okay, I'm on the right corner. But after that corner, they actually, and I found this out from my brother Kenji, they actually changed that whole road that went around behind their house. And they put in these huge like um, solar panel fields and all kinds of stuff. And so it really changed the layout around the house. And then of course, he rebuilt and remodeled his parents' house. He moved, he bought it or whatever after they passed away. And he now has his family there and kind of changed the layout of that whole area. Because I would walk past the house and I'm like, that looks like the entrance of the house, but now the rest of the house looks different, especially from an aerial viewpoint, because they don't have the, the mountainous backyard and all this. It's, it's open to another roadway with, you know, just a huge open area. So yeah, um, I found my high school that way. Um, a couple other spots that, that shrine that I got busted on the motorcycle that night. I mean, you know, I found that through, you know, Google Earth, Google Earth Pro, um, basically Street View. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, it, it isn't easy because so much time has lapsed. I, I tell you that uh, for the bigger city, cities, it'd be easier because most things stay the same. Um, maybe the names are changed, you know, <laughs> but uh yeah, the smaller areas, I would imagine they've probably gone through so much growth, probably not much looks similar, except for maybe where, you know, different shrines are at in that. Shrines and parks, that's the only thing that, that probably remains. Well, even here locally, I uh, was going to a memorial service for one of my friends and they decided to hold it at high school. And so, you know how it is, you just automatically drive to your high school because you, you do it by memory, yeah. It's something you did every day for four years. You know where your high school is. So I, I'm trying to find my high school. I'm getting completely lost. I cannot, my high school is not where it should be. Well, I found out later that they had torn down the high school and they built it half a mile away. Oh, <laughs> so totally messed up in my head. Oh, man. My wife's on, on the phone saying, no, come on, it says it's down farther this way. Like hell, it is. It should be. <laughs> <laughs> well, that tells me you haven't had any reunions there in a long time either, because no, no. you don't build high schools overnight. <laughs> now we were having a. I think I went to uh, one of our reunions. We had it at, at a nice location. Not, but maybe that's why. 
the high school wasn't available. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, sir, it's been a it's been a joy talking to you this month. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, you know, I've been anxious about it. Like I say, not a huge big deal story or anything, but you know, to have a you know a flashback going forty plus years, it's you know these small world things. I mean, I I run into them maybe no differently, no more or less than anybody else. But boy, some of these are just like zingers. You're like, holy cow, I can't believe, you know, you related to that person or you're actually there when I was there, things like that. It's like, like I'm, po I'm positive. You and I and Terry probably walked right past each other in 19, whatever, 83, 1984. We're probably all down at the bite of Seattle and yeah. bumped into each other. I got a dirty look, of course. And and, and we never even knew it, you know? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we were in such so much in the same area at the same time. I'm surprised we didn't run into each other. Exactly. So I'm looking at the calendar and uh, I'm thinking June 13th is the uh, second Sunday of next month. I'll put that out as a query, uh, see if uh, everybody's okay with that date. Yeah, that, but, should, that should be, because I think that's that's the week before Father's Day, I think. Yes, that's the it's the week before Father's Day. Yeah. And hopefully I'll be doing a comic book convention the week before that. This will be interesting to see. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of looking for comic book conventions coming back because that was sort of like a secondary income stream for me. Right. Right. It might be a primary income stream for me this year. <laughs> I'm looking forward to see all the neat costumes and everything again. Come on. <laughs> oh, you enjoy my Facebook page just to see the costumes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll see who I can line up. It'll, it'll be easy. It'll be interesting to see how many of those costumes incorporate masks. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anyway. Every everybody's gonna be a Tony Fauci this year, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh dang. Or maybe a Bane or a <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Something where it won't matter if we talk talk a little funny. Right. <laughs> it's good to see you, sir. All right, you too, Mark. See ya. Bye bye.